feeling I'd be reviewing a new 13-inch MacBook Pro sooner rather than later. When Apple refreshed the MacBook Air back in March with a new keyboard, I knew it was only a matter of time before the company did the same for the 13-inch Pro. Sure enough, earlier this week, Apple unveiled a new model with the Magic Keyboard design already in use on the Air and 16-inch MacBook Pro. With that, Apple's laptop lineup is completely rid of the controversial butterfly keyboard. As you'd expect, a MacBook Pro refresh also means updated processors. 13-inch Pro now comes with a 10th gen Intel CPU and Intel Iris Plus graphics, at least in the higher end models like the one Apple sent me for review. Also, the entry level config now comes with double the storage, that's 256 gigs. Meanwhile, the high end ones start with 16 gigs of RAM instead of eight, and there's a 32 gig upgrade option for the first time. As before, the 13 inch Pro starts at 1299 and it's available now. For this review, I'm mainly gonna focus on performance and the typing experience. Spoiler alert, it's pretty great. If you see my review of the 2020 MacBook Air or my hands-on with last year's 16-inch MacBook Pro, you already know my thoughts on the Magic Keyboard's design. Feel free to skip ahead if you've heard all this before. For those just joining us, the Magic Keyboard was inspired by the standalone Magic Keyboard that ships with the iMac line. That's to say, both have scissor-style keycaps as opposed to the butterfly design used over the past few years. That butterfly mechanism was designed to reduce key wobble, but in practice, it resulted in flat buttons that too often either failed to register presses or conversely produced double presses, which is super annoying, let me tell you. In contrast, the keys here are cushier with a full millimeter of travel. We're not talking a full return to the pre-butterfly MacBook Pro keyboards that some of you have been missing, but they are noticeably deeper than the keys on the last gen model. On the other hand, the new keys also aren't as wobbly as those long ago ones we all remember so fondly now. This is due to two things, a rubber dome that sits just below the keycap and a design that locks the scissor mechanism into the keycap at the top of the stroke. Last note on the keyboard, like the other Macs with Magic Keyboards, this one has an inverted T arrow button layout where the right and left buttons aren't quite as tall as the up and down button stack, in theory, making them easier to find by feel. I've mostly enjoyed this layout on the new Macs I've tested, though for the first time during this most recent round, I accidentally pressed the forward slash buttons a few times when I meant to hit the left arrow. Otherwise, this is the same design as before from the aluminum chassis to the port selection, which by the way includes a headphone jack and four Thunderbolt 3 sockets, two on each side. There's also the same stereo speakers as last time, the same three array mic, and the same 720p webcam, which served me adequately enough in my never ending stream of work from home meetings. The touch bar is back too, as is the Touch ID fingerprint sensor in the upper right corner of the keyboard deck. As ever, it's easy to set up and works reliably too. As for the touch bar, I still wish it weren't there, but I've made peace with it. Mostly, anyway. The 13-inch MacBook Pro is, well, still a 13-inch MacBook Pro. As before, it has a 13.3-inch Retina display with 2560 by 1600 resolution and Apple's auto-adjusting True Tone color technology. As before, the screen supports the P3 color gamut and has a 500-nit brightness rating. That came in handy when I was working near the window on a sunny day, though I also found myself cranking up the brightness in the Apple Arcade game Sayonara Wild Hearts just because I could. The game's neon colors and deep blacks lend themselves really well to the panel here, by the way. All of this is to say, it is a nice screen. My only concern is that if someone buys the 13-inch Pro now, only for Apple to come out with a more drastically redesigned MacBook Pro later, maybe one with a rumored 14-inch screen, that person might feel cheated. Then again, one never knows exactly what Apple is going to do. As with the new MacBook Air, Apple partially upgraded the 13-inch Pro line with 10th generation Intel processors. That's Intel's 10 nanometer Ice Lake chips, to be exact. Though the 13-inch MacBook Pro starts at $1299, the model I tested was a $1799 configuration with a 2 GHz quad-core Core i5 processor, Intel Iris Plus graphics, a 512GB SSD, and 16 gigs of RAM. It's important to note that while all configs have quad-core processors, the two lower-end ones, which cost $1299 and $1499, use 8th gen chips, not 10th gen. They also come with 8 gigs of memory, not 16, and the speed of the RAM is slower too. In other words, even if the 1299 or 1499 configuration is likely to be just fine for you, you'll need to test at least the 1799 model to enjoy what Apple is touting as new performance. And that's just what I have here. You can find more benchmarks in our written review, but for a taster, we ran a 4K encoding test where we transcoded the same minute-long 4K trailer to HD using the app Handbrake. Pro got the job done in 1 minute and 26 seconds. After running this test twice, the bottom of the laptop got quite hot, though the fans at least stayed reasonably quiet. For the Pro to have managed a sub-minute time, it probably would have needed a discrete GPU. 
In real world use, the Pro had no problem handling my workload, which includes multiple Chrome windows and tabs, plus Slack, Spotify, notes, photos, messages, and increasingly video calls on different platforms. For the purposes of my testing, I also introduced something that's not normally part of my routine, Fortnite. The game ran smoothly at 1280 by 800 on low settings with a frame rate limit of 60 FPS, although the fans definitely started to pipe up. In addition to Sayonara Wild Hearts, I spent some time with Where Cards Fall. Those games ran well too and pushed the fans less than Fortnite did. It's worth noting that the 13-inch Pro maxes out at Intel Iris Plus graphics, though other components are upgradable through Apple's online store. You can opt for a 2.3 GHz quad-core Core i7 CPU. There's also that 32 gig RAM option I mentioned. On the storage front, you can outfit your machine with a 1TB, 2TB, or even 4TB SSD. When it comes to battery life, Apple promises up to 10 hours each of wireless web usage and Apple TV video playback, the same claims it made with the last gen model. In our standard video rundown test, my machine managed 11 hours and 33 minutes. Not the 13 hours or more you can expect from competing machines like the Galaxy Book Flex or the Dell XPS 13, but still pretty good. Speaking of the Flex and XPS 13, here's what we think you'll be cross-shopping, or should be, if you're considering shelling out $1299 plus for the new 13-inch MacBook Pro. First up, the newly announced Microsoft Surface Book 3, which starts at $1600. The starting price on the 13.5-inch model is higher than the entry-level 13-inch Pro, but if it's 10th gen Intel processor you're after, Microsoft undercuts Apple by 200 bucks. The Surface Book 3 also touts longer battery life, up to 15 and a half hours according to Microsoft. And importantly, the Surface Book 3 is available with optional discrete Nvidia graphics. In exchange for those extra features and longer battery life though, you'll have to deal with slightly more heft, which makes sense. You should also consider Microsoft Surface Laptop 3, which starts at $1,000. Whereas Microsoft Surface Book has a removable touchscreen, the Surface Laptop line is more of a conventional laptop. Like the MacBook Pro, the 13.5-inch Surface has Intel Iris Plus graphics and 10th gen Intel processors, and it delivers around 11 and a half hours of battery life, though Microsoft's line doesn't bother with 8th gen chips at the lower end. And as a bonus, it is lighter than the 13-inch Pro. I saved the best for last. You definitely want to look at the Dell XPS 13, which starts at $1299 for the newest model, the same price as the 13-inch Pro. For the money, you get a 10th gen Intel processor, not an 8th gen chip, though you need to step up to the 1549 model to get Intel Iris Plus graphics, but you know, that's still less expensive than Apple's cheapest Iris Plus MacBook Pro. It's also much lighter than the 13-inch Pro, and it beats it out on battery life too, nearly 16 hours in our tests. We actually even use the P word in our review. Perfect. The new 13-inch MacBook Pro addresses one of our biggest complaints with the last gen model, the frustrating typing experience. Now it's that much easier to recommend with the retina display, speakers, touchpad, battery life, and overall performance rounding out the mix. The case for choosing the 13-inch Pro over a competing Windows machine will be tougher, at least for someone who's open to using either OS. Other machines offer some combination of lighter weight, longer battery life, discrete graphics, or better specs for the money. For shoppers who have been holding out for a new MacBook Pro with a better keyboard, you can upgrade now and feel confident you're making a good choice. For folks in the market for a portable machine with decent graphics and long battery life, the 13-inch MacBook Pro is just one of several strong options available right now.